This is Edward October, host of October Pod on YouTube. Hear that jingle jingle? It could be Kris Kringle, or a home invader looking for an open window, a jilted lover looking for revenge, or a disgruntled co-worker hoping to spike your eggnog with arsenic. The girls of our true crime podcast are always on Santa's nice list, but the crimes they discuss are very naughty indeed. Listener discretion is advised. Well, hello there, Jen. Hey, how are you, Cam? I am in the merry, merry Kris Kringle kind of mood. I Something know. like that. It's December 23rd, I believe. It's beginning to look a lot like my Christmas. Christmas. Still praying for snow. Still uh, sleeping with the spoon underneath my pillow. That's mm-hmm. supposed to bring snow. That's it what is. I'm doing. It is. I st- mm-hmm. uh, I've heard ice cubes in the toilet bowl. Oh. Helps too. No, I don't know. I don't know. I, I used to, when the kids were little, I used to just tell them everything. I heard that if you clean up your sock drawer, <laughs> there will be snow. Uh, oh, that's yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah. Well, whatever, whatever works. Whatever, whatever works. works. But today is day 12. It is our very day last 12. nightmare before Christmas for 12, 12, 12. 2021. So I think it's actually December 24th then, isn't it? Right? Um, I don't know. We, as you all know, that we're doing these early this year, and we're both. It's not, okay. It's the last one. Let's just put it. It's that the way. last one. Cause it's the last one, but not the last of us. Exactly. Yet Hold we'll on. be back. Unfortunately, for some of those people that dislike <laughs> us, we'll be back. We'll be back. And if you like and us, we, we'll be back. Ahead. We will be back. Yes, we'll probably be. Be. I believe. I think we haven't really talked about this, but I think January thirteenth or oh. somewhere around there. Okay. We'll be coming January 12th. Ish. Yeah. Somewhere around there. Ish. Yeah, because we usually take off. Christmas break. Holiday break. Yeah, we'll let you know. Winter break. I think break. it's the 12th. Can't wait. I had to look at my calendar. It's I know. Okay. I know. I know. It's going to be exciting. 2022. Two. Wow, that's weird. Woo. Woo. Just when I've started to write 2021 on right. all things. Yes. Time flies. Let me tell you. All, all right. right. I'm super excited. This is going to have a lot one. of carnage in it because it's, it's 12. It's 12. I didn't write all the carnage down because it's all the same thing and it's all pretty gross. And I do want to say that there is, like the others, a content warning on here. Sexual content, assault content, and some pretty gross stuff. So, all right. All right. For the 12th and final day of our 12 Nightmares Before Christmas, we are going to go to Germany. Now, we've never been to Germany before. I do not speak German. I've tried really hard to get the proper pronunciations of the names, and these have been really hard, so I might not get all of them, and I might just say the regular Americanized version, but I'll try. I can't do English pronunciation very well, like I said, so the German is difficult mm. to do. Now, Jen, I know you may know this, but I flunked out of German in high school. So <laughs> I, I, I do have a, a little German background. I well, do. We have a German. Part of my heritage is German, but I think that heritage part only lets me love German food and beer. And not it, pronounce it didn't things give me correctly. The, it didn't give me an accent. No. Yeah. But anyway, I want to know that I have never heard about this man before a few weeks ago. Now that I know about this monster, you all have to know about him. It's only fair. It's only fair. This man is known as the Roar Hunter or the Duisburg Man Eater. Ew. Okay. And Joachim Kroll would go unnoticed while he spent over 20 years killing young women and children throughout the Roar Valley in Germany. Ew. Joachim Kroll was born in Hindenburg, Germany, which would later be renamed as Zabers, Germany, on April 17th, 1933. He and his nine siblings lived with his parents in a two-room apartment. They were very, very poor. 
His father was a miner and he very abusive man, and especially to Joachim. And I'm going to call him Kroll from now on because I it's would, a bit yeah. easier. Yes. Kroll had a very low IQ. They said at one point, I believe it was 76. And not only did his father regularly call him a loser and beat on him, Kroll, but his siblings did too. And he never really had a close relationship with his siblings. Actually, he never had a close relationship with anybody. And it was quite sad. I mean, he was the scapegoat of the whole household. If anything ever went wrong or if his siblings ever got in trouble, they would say, oh, it was Kroll. Kroll did it. So he would take the beatings for everyone. Oh, that's sad. And his mother, of course, having 10 kids, pretty much couldn't give him all the love and affection that he needed, but he did feel that his mother was the only person that was ever on his side, and he felt that she was the only one that genuinely cared for him. Even though he was in the middle of this large family, he felt very lonely. Kroll went to a special needs school, and that was very difficult for him because of his IQ, who was so low. He was very timid and very reserved, very shy, not at going whatsoever, and the kids at school teased him. They mainly about his looks. They called him a loser. You know, he didn't have any friends. So once again, here he is with all these people. He's lonely. He became a loser and quite inside of himself. At the age of 10, he was drafted into the Hitler Youth. And once again, they would tease him. They called him gutless and a wimp. And they would beat on him. And it was miserable for him. And he just became very withdrawn. After World War II was over, as like many Germans that were displaced, the Kroll family traveled to find work. And I've read a few articles that stated that the Russian took Kroll's father as a prisoner of war and had never returned. Mm. In 1947, the family escaped the Russian-occupied East Germany and settled in the Ruhr area of West Germany. In 1949, Kroll became employed as a farmhand. He was quiet as always, and he did his job. But if he made a mistake, they beat him. Oh. The farm owners beat him. And once again, Kroll led this life of always being bullied. And he wasn't socially accepted. He didn't have any social skills, and he rarely spoke to anyone. But when he tried to talk to women to make friends who worked with him on the farm, since he didn't know how to act, and he was, you know, a young man, he would bluntly asked them if they wanted to have sex with him. Oh, right. No. no social cues whatsoever, this man. And it's not surprising that nobody ever said yes. And this bluntness led to people that he worked with to stay far away from him, which mm -hmm. caused him to become even more of an outsider and even more of a loner. What Kroll loved most about the farm was the slaughterhouse. Ugh. He said later that when he came into contact with the warm blood of a recently slaughtered animal, it sexually aroused him. It caused his heart to beat faster, and Kroll said he would get a strange tingling sensation that he would always call his funny feelings. He was no. also sexually aroused when the pigs and cows started to mate. And after a while, he himself would start to have his way with the cows. Ooh, yeah. ooh, that's a big one. Yeah. Ooh, terrible. By the mid-1950s, Kroll had met a waitress at a bar. He became very fond of her, and the two went out to the movies. It was like a big first date. The date actually went well, and he was still quiet, of course, but the date went well, and afterwards, she invited him back to her place. Mm. The two proceeded to get intimate, and Kroll got a bit too excited, a little bit too fast, if you get my drift. I do. It all ended prematurely. His date was not happy about it at all. And she ridiculed him and she made fun of him and she put him down. And I think she even, from what I can gather, thank you, Google Tra Translate, she even told some of his friends who made fun of him oh, for it. That's not cool. Not cool at all. And since he didn't have very much luck with ladies, he got his hands on some blow up sex dolls. With those blow-up dolls, he liked to dress them, and he did adult things to them. Mostly what he liked to do was 
strangle them with one hand while he pleasured himself. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he would even wrap a rope around their necks and hang them from the ceiling. Mm. On January 21st, 1955, Kroll's mother died. Like I said, she was the only person from whom he ever felt any love from. And with her gone, the family completely fell apart and siblings went on their separate ways, which made him alone, completely alone. And with his mother dead, there was just something inside him that just snapped, and he started to kill. In February of 1955, Kroll took a train and traveled to Ludenhausen. He didn't go there for any particular reason, but he just knew he needed to kill. Plus, he knew that it was a place that he wouldn't be known. No one knew who he was. So on a quiet country road, he saw 19-year-old Ermgard Strahl. She had also been on the train. Kroll approached her, and it's been thought that Kroll asked her to have sex. And then another story I read, it said he offered her a gift. Either way, I've heard both of them. Let me just put it this way. There's a lot of mythology around this case. Mm -hmm. We'll just put it like that. So it, it's difficult to pick through what was true and what was false. And I'll get to that later as to why. So whether he asked her for sex or whether he offered her a gift, I don't know for sure. Either way, she refused. And it made him angry. So he went behind her, mm. grabbed her, and forced her into the woods where he attacked her, somehow wrestled her where he got her bra off, and then strangled her with her own bra. Once she was dead, Crow raped her. But, of course, it was premature before there was any penetration he finished. Kroll was very upset and very angry, and he took a knife, and he just stabbed her. He totally lost all control. He stabbed her. He sliced her open like a slaughtered farm animal. Mm. Then he masturbated over her body, mm. leaving his did. DNA all over her. And to put insult to injury before he left, he defecated close to this poor girl's body. Ugh. Yes. Something is not right with him. No. No. It's his funny feelings. He said, is what made him do this, his funny mm -hmm. feelings. And it was days before Ermgard's body was found a few hundred feet from the road. And with how horrible the attack had been and the copious amount of semen that was on her body, the police actually thought the murder resulted from some sadistic gang. Oh. Thought that there was more than one person did this to her. So it was that violent. It was that violent and that much semen. Ugh. DNA on the scene was too degraded to get a blood match, because remember, that's all that they could do. They could only test for blood types in the 1950s. Police then advised women to avoid groups of men if they were out alone. They had no idea that only one man had murdered Ermgard Stahl. The next of Kroll's victims was 24-year-old Clara Tasmer. He pretty much found her the same way as Ermgard. And on June 16, 1959, Kroll went up to Clara while she was walking, after they had taken the train, obviously, and he tried to take her by the arm just to walk with her. And she pulled her arm away, as you would do, because you do not touch strangers, especially a man. You do not touch strange women. It's wrong. Anyway, she pulled her arm away, and Kroll became enraged and hit her over the head. And Clara's lifeless body was found just outside the city limits. She had been strangled and raped, and she had semen all over her body. Police not linking Clara's death to Ermgard's. They arrested a man by the name of Heinrich Ott, a 37-year-old mechanic in the area. They also link him to other murders in the area. Some very well could have been other victims of Kroll. We do not know. But Heinrich Ott would never go to trial. He hanged himself in his jail cell. This, of course, led everyone to believe that he really was guilty when he only did it because of the shame that came along with being accused of murder, which when you're not guilty. Mm -hmm. I agree. Over a month later, only 20 kilometers from Kroll's home, 16-year-old Manuela Kanat would be found in Bredigny, Germany. She had been raped, strangled, and have an unbelievable amount of semen on her body. The local police wouldn't link Manuela to the other two murders. I'm guessing the police just didn't share any information. I mean, these towns are pretty far away from Kroll, but they're pretty close together. So you would think that women being strangled, slaughtered, raped with copious amount of DNA, 
somebody would talk <laughs> to other police. It just didn't happen for some reason. I, I would think so. Only because and, somebody would know somebody that would know somebody. Somebody's aunt, uncle from over there. Thank yeah. you. Mm-hmm. Something yeah. would happen. Nothing. The media didn't even get involved. I don't know if it was such a taboo subject in the 50s in Germany. I don't know. It just went no idea why these weren't put all together. And on February 12th, 1960, 23-year-old Horst Otto would confess to killing Manuela and then retract it, saying that he had family problems, financial problems, and he needed he just needed a place to stay. So, hey, let's confess to murder. Mm -hmm. By the time he retracted his statement and said, you know, kidding, haha, just needed a place to sleep. It was too late. Otto was convicted and he actually ended up serving an entire eight years in prison before Mm. they actually released him. Sometime in the 1960s, Kral would move to Duisburg and find work as a toilet attendant in a local steelworks factory. And later he would tell police that this was the best job he ever had. He loved it. And over the next 16 years, Kral would continue to kill. He would pick a spot, usually never the same area twice. And if it was the same area, it would be years apart. He would take a train there. He would choose a female, attack them by surprise, strangle them slaughter them, masturbate over them. (laughs) He'd take off all their clothes. That was his MO. He did the same thing all the time. The only thing that would change would be the victim's ages. As he got older, his victims would get younger. Mm. Younger victims were easier to control. Criminal psychiatrist David Holmes said that Kroll may have associated simplicity and innocence of children with the innocence and simplicity of of the animals that he handled on the farm. I will say that one on August of 1965, Kroll was out on Lover's Lane, three hours south of Duesenberg, when he spotted Herman Schmitz and his 18-year-old fiance Marion Veen. Now, Kroll liked to go to Lover's Lane because he would watch young couples have sex in their cars, and while he watched, he would pleasure himself right Ew. outside Ew. the vehicle. I mean, Ew. he... Like, they could see him if, yes. And as soon as Kroll laid eyes on Marion, he wanted her. He needed to have her. He thought he would take his knife, stab the tire, the tire would go flat, then Herman, the male, would get out and change it, leaving Kroll to take Marion for himself. Instead, Herman drove off, not realizing he had a flat tire, or for whatever reason, Herman just drove off. So Kroll, wanting to stop it, jumped in front of the car. Herman stopped the car and got out of his vehicle, saying, God only knows. Should have ran him over. Exactly. And approached Kroll because Kroll was this teeny tiny petite weasel of a man. Seriously, (laughs) he was weaselly little guy. And Herman was big, tall, muscular guy. He wasn't afraid. And so when Herman got close to Kroll, Kroll stabbed him. And Marion was petrified, but no dummy. She got in the driver's side and hit the gas. She went out of her way to hit Kroll, but he escaped. He left on foot because she was trying to get away. Actually, she was smart enough that she took a hair clip and somehow rigged the car horn to blare consistently. Like she jammed her hair clip into the car horn to make Mm -hmm. it constantly blare. So Kroll didn't want his victims to give him any trouble. So he just ran out. He just left on foot. But they're unfortunately, lucky. oh, they're not lucky. Unfortunately, Kroll's knife pierced Herman's heart on the first hit. Oh. And as Marion cradled his head on her lap, he passed before help could even arrive. And Herman Schmitz was the only man that Kroll ever killed. By 1970, I'm not sure what kind of thing happened, but Kroll developed some sort of issue with his legs. I think it was some kind of blood vessel issue. He had to have surgery, which really hurt his mobility. So this affliction meant that he pretty much had to hunt victims closer to home. But he did tell police that because of this, he didn't murder anyone for six years. Wow. Now, the police didn't believe him at all. They had 15 unsolved sexually motivated murders in the area. Most were children. So they pretty much think that he's responsible for at least some of them. And Kroll would later admit that his memory wasn't great. So maybe he was responsible for them. But he claimed that he had gotten all rid of all those funny feelings. Every time those funny feelings came up, 
which pretty much is aggressive, mean, murderous sexual urges. Mm -hmm. He said he relieved those by using his sex dolls. Uh Uh-huh. I don't believe it. July of 1976, Kroll would finally make a mistake that would lead the police to knock on his front door. Good. He took a little girl that lived in his apartment complex in Lahr, Germany. On the afternoon of July 3rd, 1976, Kroll was looking out his apartment window when he noticed four-year-old Marion Kettler playing unattended on the playground. And he got that funny feeling. Ugh. Now, Kroll was known as Uncle Akim around the complex. He would give children candy and little gifts, and no one ever guessed that this quiet man with a low IQ could ever hurt anyone. But Kroll somehow enticed Marion into his apartment, and there inside he molested her, and when she struggled... He strangled her. Mm. By 4 p.m., Ms. Kettler, Marion's mom, started to worry because she couldn't find her daughter. And after searching the area and asking all the kids in the neighborhood who didn't know where she was at, she called the police. And sometime that same day, a neighbor of Kroll's, Oscar Muller, went to use the shared bathroom down the hall. And as he got closer, he saw Kroll, who told him, hey, toilet's backed up, don't use it, mm. wouldn't use it. And Oscar asked what was stopping it up, and Kroll said, guts. Oscar, of course, was shocked, but Kroll went on to say that he had killed a hare, or a rabbit, and he was trying to get rid of the innards by flushing it, but it clogged the toilet. Mm -hmm. Kroll said that he would fix the problem, and he went and got the remains out of the toilet and put them in the apartment building's trash can. Police started to search for Marion, and... Some searched the outside area while other police officers went knocking door to door on the apartment complex. When police talked with Oscar, for some reason he mentions the toilet being backed up, and that piqued the officer's interest, so they headed straight to Kroll's place. They knocked on the door and asked if he knew anything about Marion, and you know what? He nods, lets them inside. Then they asked if he was involved in any way, shape, or form in a disappearance, and he said yes. And he took them to his refrigerator. He did? When he opened up the refrigerator door, police saw the remains of the four-year-old Marion. Kroll had what looked like to be soup on the stove, and inside the pot, amongst the vegetables, was a tiny hand and foot. Oh. Kroll told the officers, quote, I tried it. It didn't taste good. On an interview in June of 2021 from a German publication called Focus Online, Lead investigator on the Kroll murders, his name is Bernd Jaeger, said, now remember, this is Google Translate, and it's the best we can get here. Quote, we weren't the first to arrive at the crime scene. The investigation against Kroll began with the dead four-year-old Marion, long after his first crimes. We heard that Marion was found upstairs in the apartment. We were told about the pot in which her hands and feet were found with bite marks. Marion's head was on the bottom of the fridge with two large brown eyes that looked at you when you opened the door. Later, I saw all of this myself when I arrived at the crime scene. Kroll is known as a cannibal. If you go online and you read all the things about him, it said that every person that he murdered, he took a slice of meat out of. He didn't. It was all part of the media, and we'll go into that. Marion was the first person that he tried to consume, but he can, tried to consume her without cooking the meat. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So just that whole being a huge cannibal was made up by the media. Kroll was arrested without incident and taken into custody. And of course, the media went nuts. Police knew that there was no way that this was his first murder. There had been over 1,200 unsolved murders and missing persons cases over the next past 10 years, and they believed Kroll played a part in some of them. And they weren't going to get anywhere with evidence because all they could really prove was blood type. And, of course, no computers to link similar cases. And as we discussed before, it doesn't seem like any police Department spoke with other police departments. Hmm. So the police were thinking, how are they 
they're going to have to get Kroll to confess to some of these other murders. Getting Kroll to confess to the other murders proved to be a problem. Bern Yeager, who I mentioned earlier, said that when he first saw Kroll, his first impressions of him was a mousy, nondescript man. And talking to him was like talking to a brick wall. They would ask him questions, and he wasn't used to people actually talking to him or asking him anything about himself. He just kind of like shut down. He hmm. just couldn't handle it. So Jaeger said he had to find a way to get Kroll to talk since Kroll normally wouldn't speak to many people. And they also knew that he had a very low IQ. 76 tops is from what I've read. That was the highest number that they gave out. So they tried to engage him as they would a child. They played puzzle games with him and counting games. Like they said that the counting games was kind of important later because it meant if he knew how to count, he could count the number of victims that he had. That was mm -hmm. kind of like the whole reason for that behind that playing of that game. And slowly but surely, Kroll started to open up and it would take him a long time to open up. But he does confess to things of these murders, but they don't make sense. Like he would get the murders mixed up. He couldn't tell them correctly. And Kroll said that he wanted to admit what he had done because he felt that if he did, the funny feelings that he had that caused him to do all this, if he told everybody what happened, those funny feelings would go away because he believed that the funny feelings were what made him kill. Mm -hmm. The police decide that they were going to take him on to the murder sites. And Kroll thought that if he saw the locations, he would be able to remember exactly what he did. And the investigators were hopeful that if Kroll could even act out the crimes, he'd be able to give them more information. And of course, the media had a heyday with this. I bet they um, loved it. They did. And this goes back to, there was a newspaper. Well, it's a National Enquirer type newspaper. They would publish all sorts of things. And Kroll would give them saying stuff like, oh, I ate the meat because you know how expensive meat is nowadays. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And they would run with it. And they would say the police are giving him, bribing him with fancy cakes and blah, blah, blah. And then I watched this interview with the burned Jaeger and he's like, no, that's not what we did. We were talking to him and we're like, what do you want to eat? He said, oh, I'd like a cake. So he's like, we want him to talk. So, of course, we're going to give him a cake. We weren't bribing him. We were just trying to, you know, Can open up. being yeah. nice to him, right? Mm -hmm. You got to do. So anyway, a lot of the information out there, you really have to be careful what really happened and what this National Enquirer magazine made up. So yeah, anyway. And in the same June 2021 Focus online article, Jaeger said, because he wasn't a man eater, that's what the Build newspaper came up with. Kroll never sawed off a leg ate it or something like that. But that was the case with the Marion case. The other victims he just left without bothering it. I definitely do not want to approve of his actions as an investigator. However, it's always important to me to deal fairly with the accused. He also stated that Kroll only got interested in trying human meat right before he killed Marion. Mm. Like right before he went into killing a domesticated animal to try that because and that's what got him interested and then the next person he killed was Marion and that's but other than that as far as we know he never tried any other human meat everything you read online is wrong all right back to here when the police took Kroll out to the crime scenes the media went along of course and Kroll reenacted his attacks and he was able to give them details of 12 different murders Jaeger said in an interview that it was like Kroll had a photographic memory. He would lead the police into areas that weren't in any of the files that they had brought along. But when the police looked into it further, they discovered a crime that had happened on the spot, and it happened just like Kroll had said. Kroll does discuss an unsuccessful attack on a 10-year-old girl by the name of Gabrielle. Now, she lived in a nearby town. And Kroll took a sick day one day and saw Gabrielle after she left school. The two started to talk. One thing I read said that she knew who he was. Like she called him Uncle Akim. Oh. He had given her candy. Either way, the two went for the walk. And then when they got to a place where no one is around, 
Kroll said he had something to show her. He gave her a book of pornographic cartoons. She was embarrassed, and she didn't know what to say or do or anything, and that's when Kroll realized that something's not right, and he panicked, and he strangled her, and he just left her for dead. Luckily, she survived, and she was able to go home and tell her mother. Now, I guess, because of the time that it happened, the mother and the family never reported the incident. And they only came forward after Kroll was arrested. Were they scared, do you think? I don't know. I don't know if they were just scared or if... That could have saved a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Think. Not one to judge. She was only 10. No, the mom, I mean. No, I know, but her daughter was only 10. I don't know the reasoning. It could have been the time. Nowadays, women don't report rape. Not that this was a rape, but people just didn't report stuff. I don't know. I can't say. After a few months of police interviewing Kroll and taking him to locations and all sorts of stuff, they were able to get Kroll on 12 murders of women and children. Out of those 12, police had already arrested four other men for some of those crimes. Mm. Two of those people would kill themselves because they were falsely accused. And the shame of it and thinking it like, and we've talked about this on here, when you're accused of that, everybody hears it. But then when you're, you know, exonerated or the confession was wrong or the witness recanted, you don't hear about that. Nobody so hears about that. Is mm-hmm. ruined already. On There's a documentary, well, not a, do- a TV show, called World's Most Evil. I believe that's the one. I watched two documentaries on this. The daughter of one of the men that hanged himself spoke and that after he hanged himself, his wife and mother-in-law goes, well, I guess he really was guilty. Mm-mm. And it mm. wouldn't be until Kroll confessed to it that they would know that he wasn't. But she like lived in shame because her father killed a child, or so they thought. I mean, it, it's pretty horrible, to be well, quite honest. I can't imagine. Especially to be accused of a crime is bad enough, but to be accused of being a child killer when you didn't do it. Especially with what Kroll did. I mean, it just wasn't yeah. a rape and murder. He mutilated the bodies and he did horrible things. I mean, he just, he's up there. That's why I'm kind of surprised that I haven't heard of him before this. Mm-hmm. Later, through his attorney, Kroll would say that he had killed upwards of 30 people. Mm-mm. But without being able to speak with him or taking Kroll to the locations, Police could pretty much only link him to those original 12 murders, plus the attempted murder. Kroll didn't show any remorse for killing any of his victims. He didn't care who they were or what their names were. They were only objects to him, and they were a way to get rid of the funny feelings that came from his body. Mm. In April of 1982, Kroll was only convicted to eight murders and one attempted murders. And the reason why is they had already, the four cases, four other cases had already been closed out because they had arrested the wrong men for those. Kroll was sentenced to life in prison. And Kroll wasn't really too upset because he thought that what would happen is his punishment would actually be to go and be given a corrective surgery and the doctor would fix his problem that funny feeling and then they'd allow him to go back home no no it's not the way that works buddy Mm -mm. Hmm. Joachim Kroll died of a heart attack on July 1st 1991 and he was 58 years old Hmm. and if you go look him up and if you have a VPN and you can go to the German website you'll see a lot of the newspaper pictures of him reenacting his attacks and it's really bizarre just that they published it in the paper and I don't know. Well, I was going to say, I guess because he is mentally lower, he probably liked that attention. Do you know what I'm saying? Like they were coming to see him and he liked it. He got to be on camera. And so maybe, yeah, I don't, it's just kind of funny because I was, I found him in a book of serial killers and they were, he sliced the buttock off such and such. And then he sliced the inner thigh off 
and he might have done that, but he never took them home to eat them. So I'm like, okay, this is a nice, this is interesting. And then the whole cannibal thing to the end of the 12 nightmares before. I mean, it was fascinating for me. And then I like go into all these British sites and British newspaper, read the interviews with the actual investigator. And it's a completely different story. Completely different. If you really want a lesson of don't believe everything that you read or watch, this is it. They sensationalized everything back then. I mean, Mm -hmm. basically all the information is the documented National Enquirer piece. And I guess that's what people want to hear. If it bleeds, it leads. Yes, people love that. Mm -hmm. You know that. It's just I was shocked on how different what I had read than what was actually happened. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a night and day. Not, still not a nice person. He's still I mean, not he's a still no. Tried to be no, a cannibal, but not as, No, and I would love to know the psychology behind what happened. Was it because it's the whole thing? Are they born murderers? Mm-hmm. Are they made murderers? Is it because he lacked love and affection as a child? Was he not nurtured enough? Was it because he was bullied? I mean... Why was he sexually aroused with the blood of slaughtered animals? Why? Wow, so gross. I just would love to like sit just down all of with it someone. all came together and made it happen. Yeah. He wasn't a smart man, Jenny. He did have a low IQ, but I don't think maybe that did play a part of it. Maybe but I don't think that necessarily IQs. plays a part of it. I think that that was just His, a contributing him. factor. Right. That's what I meant. You put them His all together. Being, You know, like it took his lawyer tried to get him acquitted on saying that he was incapable to stand trial. He couldn't stand trial. They tried Mm -hmm. to get him not reason of insanity, but just because he, quote, they're saying not mine, feeble minded. Mm -hmm. But But that doesn't make you a killer. But then again, he shouldn't be acquitted either. Mm -mm. (laughs) I mean, nope. I mean, he did it. He admitted it. He, he did. Straight away. If he, he, had if he admitted it, no he had to know it was wrong. Well, but see, he admitted it because he wanted those funny feelings to go away. He wanted to get help. He knew it was wrong, but he didn't control them. He couldn't control them. He couldn't control them, but obviously he knew right from wrong. And that is a concept he that blamed... we are taught when we're very, very young. So I'm sure those feelings, feelings, and by feelings, is it what I think? Like, you know. Tingling? Somehow he associated slaughtering with sex. But I'm saying, was it like he was becoming erect? Is that what the tingling was? I that... Google Translate didn't tell me that. <laughs> I mean, that's what I was assuming, because that's especially with I... the lower IQ, then that would not quite understanding the human body. Right. I would, I would think that that's what that meant. Right. And I think there was a culmination of being embarrassed by his premature ejaculation and he didn't like the struggle and he didn't know how he was awkward around humans much less women and he because he would rape them after they were dead mm. yeah wow is all Merry Christmas say. everyone <laughs> and with that go and have a nice <laughs> Christmas Eve and Christmas Day delicious Enjoy your dinner. meal with your family yeah. oh I'd never heard of him either. Yeah. But, you know, it's... uh, He didn't like... He said he didn't like it. And then, you know, the bird Jaeger was like, well, that's because he didn't cook it first or something to that effect. You know, it's translated. But still, I just couldn't... If you could see my face right now, you'd... I know. I'm like... I just couldn't... Could you imagine being those officers to Mm -mm. go in and open up a refrigerator and then there's... Mm -mm. No. Nope. No, I cannot. Little brown eyes looking at you. No. Mm -mm. That's therapy for years well i'm sure your initial thought would be this is fake right this is fake like detective jaeger was only two years in homicide and he had a son that was just a little older than marion and this was like he was thrown in this huge case as a rookie homicide cop that would be a pit a pit you're thrown into the pit with the wolves and the lions that's terrible yeah i would love to sit and speak with the man he's very Charming. Is he German? Jaeger? Mm-hmm. Yes. Anyway, it's very interesting, and I strongly suggest to go look him up. Try to stay away from the ones that 
talk about how he slaughtered them for meat because he didn't. It was all for sexual satisfaction, which is just gross enough. Yeah, I was just going to say it doesn't. That's all disgusting. But oh, you'll see disgusting. his picture will be on the cover and you'll see how what a mice, mousy, mm-hmm. weaselly looking. There's one picture of him when he's reenacting his crime where he looks like the man in Princess Bride that says it's inconceivable. Oh, yeah. That man, except he's a lot. Yeah, except he's a lot like wiry, more wiry, thinner, weaselly looking. Mm -hmm. Like, I I love that man. I don't know his name. He's a character actor. Yeah, he's a character actor. I love the inconceivable man. But that's that's who he reminded me. Yeah. He's got a little lisp. Yeah. But smaller and maybe 75 pounds lighter. Well, Just a scrawny looking guy. And you know what? That probably made him not as fearful either. So yeah. little kids and people. They said he was nondescript. Them. Another thing that the media would play up was he. they said he had tons of dolls in his room, in his apartment. Tons of dolls for the little girls to come play with. No, he had sex dolls. He didn't have baby dolls. dolls. He had sex dolls. That's that's a whole other so. concept. Yeah, I don't, I don't even want to get into because yeah. yeah, it was just interesting how much was fabricated on this. Mm-hmm. There's another documentary called "Killers from the Myth" or something that mm-hmm. talked a little bit about that. So yep. I don't know. I just thought it was interesting. Don't so trust don't the ever, media. Always no. Very good, Jen. Very mm-hmm. very well detailed and a little bit too much detail for my liking, yeah, but. Well. Sorry. It's, you know, it's the 12th day of Christmas. You can't so. really discuss him without going into I know, what just he did. <laughs> Yuck is what it is. Yuck. Yeah. Anyway, to all of our listeners out there, we wish you a very merry Christmas, a very hi- happy holiday season. And we hope you're enjoying some quiet time or getting ready to enjoy a little quiet time and have a nice holiday. Jen, do you have any parting words? I want to say thank you to everybody that listens. You are amazing, and I'm probably going to start crying. I need why? <laughs> it's, it's Stop! Just, I am flattered that people take time out to listen to us. You Did and it? I talking about gross murder. things, murder, and things that our family don't even want to hear us. Our family will tune us out, but we have they people do. that tune in, <laughs> and that is amazing to me. And I do have to say, I don't think anybody in your family listens and none in my family listen. Well, I guarantee yeah, none I don't in my so. family listens. Yeah, I don't think so. But I'm just flattered by everyone that tunes in, that reaches out to us, that leaves us a nice review. I'm humbled and grateful and we appreciate you. I can't follow that up, Jen. <laughs> I'm Jeez. just saying. It's heartfelt. It and is when heartfelt. I say love you. I mean it. She does. I'm not lying. I don't. She does. I'm just kidding. With my well, heart and soul. Well, I guess we will not see these good people for two weeks, give or two take. Weeks. Two like weeks. We're, we're planning on January 12th. Just know that we do love you and we hope you have a fantastic holiday season and we'll see you soon. That's right. But until then, remember, Jen, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye bye. Love ya. See you soon. Today's episode was researched and written by me, Jen. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com 
slash Our True Crime Podcast. You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya.